This episode has been brought to you by Omaze. Isn't that strange? You'd think that the Americans love their horsepower with all the powerhouse muscle cars coming out recently. And not to mention the pony car and muscle car craze that spanned two decades some 60 years ago. But what if I told you that there was a time where there were almost no sports cars available in the USA? That people drove dull and boring everyday sedans? And what about the Chevrolet Corvette, America's very first sports car? Well, the Corvette certainly wasn't the first, there was a lot more going on. So what was America's very first sports car? Let me tell you all about it in episode 35 of the Automotive History series that is the American sports car craze of the early 1950s. As always, let's step back a little before we hit the 1950s. As soon as the car became somewhat of a common sign on the road and many companies had figured out the car building game, the car was no longer a novelty item or a toy for the rich and they moved on to more luxurious and sporty car offerings. Different flavors in cars started to appear, fueled by car racing. Ten years after the Benz patent motorwagen and the first types of motor races were already being held. And by the 1920s and 1930s, some companies made a living out of attending races and make some cash on the side by also selling their high-speed models, albeit slightly more driver-friendly. Think of the British Bentley. Also, don't forget that there were companies that made ultra-luxurious cars where effortless performance was part of the marketing strategy. And the best example is the American Duesenberg. What I'm trying to say is that there were already plenty of performance cars driving around in the 1920s and the start of the 1930s, back then mostly known as touring cars, or roadsters, but not sports cars. And all was well if it wasn't for the Great Depression to break out. Many people lost a lot of money, and almost all luxury and sports car makers had a hard time staying afloat. Plenty of car makers didn't make it. And as soon as the effects of the Great Depression were over and things were finally looking up again, it was the Second World War that once again limited the interest in sports cars. Even worse, after the attack on Pearl Harbor and the United States was getting seriously involved in the Second World War, the government ordered that from February 1942 onwards, no cars could be made, only war material. And let's face it, people had other things on their mind at the time. After the war was over, there was a sense of this never again. People looked ahead to brighter times, and those brighter times would come. And in the meantime, many Americans were already accustomed to buying a new car every couple years or so. But because of the war, they couldn't for a full three years. By 1945, even the newest of cars were already three years old, and the demand for new cars was huge. However, due to a lasting shortage of steel and other materials, there wasn't much the established car companies could do, resulting in the quote-unquote new cars for 1946 that were essentially a carryover of the models built right before the war, but sometimes even plainer looking. Tell me, you like looking at all these sports cars I'm about to show you? Well, guess what? Imagine owning one. That's right, I'm excited to work with Omaze again to offer you the chance to win a Super Performance Cobra. Cruise down the roads in this iconic American Roadster, powered by a 7.3-liter Ford Godzilla V8, making 650 horsepower. You want to have the chance to win this car? Go over to www.omaze.com slash reviews to enter your chance to win this monstrous muscle machine. The link is in the description. And remember, not only will you get a chance to win this car, your donations will also benefit the Peterson Automotive Museum. I like automotive history, they like automotive history, and with your donations you can help to preserve the cars that matter and develop new exhibitions, community events and education programs. So, what are you waiting for? Go over to www.omaze.com slash reviews for your chance to win this Super Performance Cobra! During the Second World War, a bit of crossbreeding happened in the automotive landscape. Some high-ranking officers and soldiers within the US Army took some of their own cars or Army-ordered personnel cars with them to the battlegrounds in Europe. 
After the war was over, many simply left their cars over there, and that spawned a little European love for the American car, one that would eventually lead to guys in their 20s making YouTube videos about them. <clears throat> The opposite also happened. Plenty of young US soldiers were stationed in the UK, awaiting for the deployment in Europe. And in the meantime, to pass the time, they got acquainted with the little nimble sports cars that were common on the British roads. Far from fast, they were fun to drive and throw around the corner. And as soon as the war was over, many returning GI Joes took home some of these British sports cars and planted the seed of the light sports car fascination. The British government, which was hugely in debt because of the war, picked up on this and pressured the British car makers to actively export their cars to other countries in order to make some extra money. The credo was export or die. Seeing that the little sports cars proved popular in the US, many British car makers turned their attention to the USA, the MGTC arguably being the flagship of the bunch. Seeing that the import of British sports cars is gaining traction, a sporty car, especially targeted to the youth, might be a huge untapped market, especially considering the growing hot rod scene. The biggest car-loving country in the world had no sports car? How was it even possible? And here they are, some marketing geniuses in the industry, as well as in the home garage, that went to work. A sports car boom was about to begin in the United States. This led to some homemade attempts at creating a unique sports car in the hopes of being the first. The list, as a result of the many anonymous and failed attempts, is an exhaustive one, so I'll stick to the more well-known stories. And so I present you arguably America's very first post-war sports car, the Houston Rocket, for 1947. This, um... Hmm... This... Contraption? Car? UFO? Flying saucer? Uh, you name it. This uh, thing was the result of a man who wanted to build a car that would have his name on it. Does that sound familiar? See, William Shem Hewson already operated a body shop since 1940, and by 1945, right after the war, he started a new company named Hewson Pacific Corporation and started the development of a new sports car in the hopes of being the first. A car that would be extremely aerodynamic and would cost a thousand bucks, slightly under the retail price of a base-level Chevrolet at the time, so quite cheap. The end result was the Houston Rocket. Shaped like an inverted teardrop, the car was made entirely out of aluminium mm panels welded together with deeply recessed headlights and devoid of anything that would stick out, like the door handles. Information on the car is limited, as Mr. Houston burned through all of his money with the development of this car. It would never reach the production stage, and only one was made. Let's jump forward a couple of years to the late 1940s. A company by the name of Curtis Kraft already had a long legacy in auto racing by building their own variety of performance vehicles. Think midget cars, quarter midgets, sprint cars, and cars made ready for the runs on the Bonneville Salt Flats. Curtis Kraft knew a thing or two when it comes to building fast cars, and what wins on Sunday sells on Monday. Keeping the growing automobile market and earlier success by modifying standard passenger cars in mind, owner Frank Curtis went to work to create a civilized version of one of his many sports cars. A two-seater open-top roadster made out of aluminum mm, with American power, European handling and cosmopolitan looks. The end result is the Curtis Sports Car, better known as the KSC for 1949, by many regarded as the real, true, first American sports car. Much of the underpinnings and drivetrain came from Ford. It was powered by Ford's flathead V8. And although the engine made modest power, the body, because of the materials used, was rather light, and the founder of the National Hot Rod Association managed to get it up to speeds of around 140 miles per hour. Very impressive for the time period. What also was impressive was its retail price. Starting from $3,500, you could option it all the way up to close to $5,000. And that is Cadillac territory and way past its main competitor, the Jaguar XK120. After some 20 KSCs made, Frank Curtis realized that the production was, of course, financially unfeasible and wanted to get rid of it. 
And here is where it gets interesting. In 1950, Frank managed to sell the complete set of tooling, blueprints and trademarks to a sucker for a grand total of $200,000. Who the hell was mad enough to pay 200 grand for something that was proven to be a financial mistake? This man right here, Earl Madman Munz. Earl Munz was already a well-known businessman at the time, like the 40s version of Donald Trump. He always came across as somewhat of a slight lunatic, but underneath there was a serious and successful businessman that made fortunes by selling low-priced TVs, radios and cars. And the madman was at it again by trying to sell America's very first true sports car by buying the KSC project. He rebranded the cars into what would become the Munz Jets. Pretty much the same car, but now a four-seater and powered by a Cadillac V8 engine instead of a Ford. But I don't have to tell you that this was also doomed to fail. According to the madman, he lost a thousand dollars on every jet sold, but still managed to make around 400 of them. But by 1954, the production had ended. But don't you worry, the madman was far from broke. He just jumped onto his next highly profitable endeavor. The problem with many of these custom-built sports cars is their retail price. And they are no match to the affordable low-priced British sports cars, or even the more expensive ones, like the Jaguar. But the makers of the very compact Crossley cars thought differently. Crossley, a company erected during the aftermath of the Great Depression, made some fortune by selling very crude and low-priced cars, specifically targeted to the people that simply needed to go from A to B. And by the late 40s, they entered the sports car craze with their hotshot. And this little thing sure was hot. Powered by a four-cylinder making 26 horsepower, this thing was the hottest shot in town. No, really, it accelerated just as fast as an MG, thanks to its very low weight. And with a base price of around $850, also very competitively priced. Half the price of an MG. However, because of a faulty engine design a couple years back, Crossley's image was already going slowly down the drain. And by 1952, the company vanished. By 1951, it was the turn of an established car company to make America's first true sports car. Nash, a so-called independent car maker not owned by a larger company. Seeing that the standard passenger sedan was getting highly competitive, Nash shot ways to make themselves stand out. They did this by venturing into the compact car market, largely ignored by the big three, and also by coming up with a sports car to further improve the public image. But where the hell were they going to get their hands on a sports car? Well, where do most of them come from? That's right, the UK. And so Nash turned to Donald Healy, car designer and rally driver and owner of a small car company. And the end result was the Nash Healy for 1951, a slightly more comfort-oriented open-top two-seat roadster that borders on being a Grand Tourer or GT. A year later, a redesign was done by the Italian coach builder Pininfarina that added some extra European flair to it. The headlights were now placed in the grille. Very unusual at the time, but it looked beautiful nonetheless. And, if we look at history, also very futuristic, because only 10 years after the Nash Healy, headlights incorporated in the grille became the norm. This cross-continental trip between Italy, the UK and the USA did make it a costly vehicle to produce, with retail prices once again a lot higher than many people were willing to spend. And if that wasn't enough, the brand Nash was about to vanish in the process of creating the newly found American Motors Corporation, or AMC. And if that wasn't enough, a lower-priced American sports car was coming up that would eventually kill off the Nash Healy. After years of slow sales, the car was discontinued in 1954. And so we arrive at the last example for today. Kaiser, or really Kaiser Fraser, another independent car company, much like Nash, started out in the late 40s with the hopes of becoming a big player within the American auto industry. 
They were off to a great head start right after the war, until the big three eventually caught up and car sales slowly dropped by the start of the 50s. And in an effort to regain the public interest, it was time for a halo car, a good-looking, attention-grabbing sports car that would be the big three and the influx of British sports cars. The final answer was the Kaiser Darren for 1954, the car that will always give you a little kiss. The Darren was based on the already existing in-house Henry J platform, which was regarded as an uncommonly good handling car, albeit a bit slow. The body of the J was replaced by a newly designed and European-looking sports car body, and voila, the Darren was born. The car gained favorable reviews, the handling was praised, but the car was quite slow to be really competitive. But one cool feature were the doors, sliding doors that would move forward and disappear in the front fenders, for easy access. Alas, that also didn't help. The Darren failed because of numerous reasons. It was too pricey. It was too slow. People questioned the longevity of the Kaiser name. The car was uneasy to enter. The sliding doors proved troublesome. The Chevrolet Corvette, released around the same time, was more popular. And then there was an exceptional snowstorm that would cover the cars parked outside and didn't do the fiberglass body any good. And the list goes on. By 1955, the Kaiser brand was gone. As it turned out, the many failed attempts of making an American sports car were a combination of overambitious dreams, too little money, relative attractiveness and competitiveness of the British sports car, and the final nail in the coffin of the homemade American sports car is this, the Chevrolet Corvette, America's first true sports car. The sports car is dead. Long live the sports car. So why the final nail in the coffin? The Corvette is another sports car, right? It sure is. But you'll understand that as soon as an established automotive conglomerate like General Motors is going to meddle in the tiny and vulnerable sports car market, you know it's over. Back it up, back it in, you're no match to the industry giants. The Corvette was the established American auto industry's answer to the sports car interest. A fiberglass-bodied open-top roadster with, interestingly enough, a six-cylinder instead of a V8. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you the history of the Corvette, there are plenty of other videos out there. What you should know is that after this short craze, the sports car did not vanish in the US, far from it even. The Corvette was here to stay, and so were the British sports cars, at least for the coming decades. The Corvette would eventually be joined by the rivaling Ford Thunderbird, a sporty but not a true sports car, and in the meantime, even the average boring sedan would slowly gain higher performance V8 engines, with ever-increasing horsepower numbers. But the taste for a small, affordable, open-top tourist would remain, eventually creating the entirely unique American take on the theme – the Pony Car, with the Ford Mustang as the billboard of it all in the mid-60s, followed by the muscle car craze shortly thereafter. Today, the interest in the small and nimble sports car is still as lively as ever. Two words. Super Performance Cobra. <laughs>